Hi, and welcome to, to the USDA Beginning Farmer Rancher in the Know. I'm Kathy Fergie. I'm with the Oregon USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service. I have the pleasure of wearing several hats related to outreach, including that of the Beginning Farmer Rancher Oregon State Coordinator. Over the course of the session today, you'll meet the other members of the Oregon um, USDA Beginning Farmer Rancher team. And they represent Farm Services Agency, Natural Resources Conservation Service, Risk Management Agency, and Rural Development. Additionally, I want to introduce our Zoom technicians for today because they're super important. We have Corey Owens and Aaron Roth uh, with Natural Resources Conservation Service. They're here to help ensure that all the programming runs super smoothly. And um, Aaron especially is gonna be guiding our breakout room process. This is actually the first of four quarterly sessions that are aimed at providing beginning farmer ranchers tools that they need to successfully navigate working with USDA. Kind of depending on what we hear back from you in today's session, we may also invite other partners in that are gonna help you better build your farm business. Today, we're gonna to start with some basic introductions to each agency and NRCS and risk management are gonna provide some key information and important deadlines um, that you need to know about for this fall. Then we're gonna move into agency specific breakout sessions um, where you the participant can visit with the agencies that you choose. Um, heads up, Corey, here you go. There will be polling along the way to help us better understand who you are and to help us shape up the session that we're gonna have in January. So please be sure to use the polls. And with that, we're gonna jump right in to our first session. Um, if you have any questions, please use the chat. Um, you so can we have our first your... poll up. So we wanna see who's with us today. Yes, please. Um, also use the chat to say who you are um, and um, leave contact information uh, so we can share more information with you in the future if you're not already on one of my contact lists. Um, also feel free uh, to use like the waving hand signal. If you have a question, we can always stop in the middle if we need to, um, but primarily I encourage you to hang on um, for the agency sessions, because I think those are gonna be uh, really good one-on-ones this afternoon. So who do we got here, Corey? We've got folks who are new to farming and this is gonna be their first introduction to USDA programs. And nice. there are some folks who are new and they've heard about us and they came to learn more. And we've got some folks who have got some farming experience and then folks who are established and are interested in USDA. So we got a nice kind of spectrum of folks who are hearing about us from the first time to those who probably know us and are ready to learn more. Great. Do you see, Kathy, you should see the poll results. Do you see that on your screen? I do, but it's fun to have okay. you read them off. No problem. I'll go ahead and close Keep that. things broken up and moving around just a little bit. Alrighty, so our first session is gonna be with Natural Resources Conservation Service. Um, we'll have Stacy Cooper and Stephanie Payne share with us a little bit about them. Stacy is a small farm and organic specialist covering the North Coast and low, Lower Willamette Basin for USDA Department of Agriculture, Natural Resources Conservation Service. She's been in this role for about a year after having served as a soil conservationist for the NRCS in New Hampshire. And we're so excited that she came to Oregon. Stacy's introduction to NRCS came as a beginning farmer in New Hampshire, where she worked with the NRCS programs to implement farm and forest conservation projects on a 15 acre diversified organic farm that she managed. Stephanie 
uh, Payne is an NRCS small farm and organic specialist based out of Redmond, Oregon. She helps deliver financial and technical assistance um, for NRCS in central and eastern Oregon. She assists small farm and ranches transitioning organic and certified organic producers by developing conservation plans to address natural resource concerns that exist on their property. She began her career as a college intern in the Pathways program and completed her internship in Pendleton, Oregon. Yay for Eastern Oregon. I'm just gonna put a plug there. Uh, while finished her degree in environmental science through OSU. From her internship in Pendleton, Stephanie took a full-time position as NRCS coil, soil conservationist for Deschutes and Jefferson counties, where she's worked on large-scale in irrigation improvement projects and fuels reduction program. Um, and Stephanie has been in the NRCS small farms and organic as, worked as a small farms and organic specialist since August 2020, so just a year in. All righty, um, with that, you guys go ahead and take it away. Thanks for the introduction, Kathy. Um, yeah. I'm going to give a little start here. So Stephanie and I will sort of tag team NRCS, so uh, Natural Resources Conservation Service. Uh, NRCS is the acronym and how we refer to ourselves often. Um, so I'm going to start with just a little framework of NRCS and what we do, and then Stephanie is going to follow up with some of the information about specifically how producers work with us and uh, some of the benefits that we have. So uh, next slide, please. So what does NRCS do? So we provide technical assistance, which is knowledge sharing and resources for landowners and producers, as well as financial assistance in the form of cost share programs, um, all of which are aimed at addressing natural resource concerns. Uh, our programs are geared for resource conservation, not necessarily farm production or starting new operations, although we'll often find that our resource conservation goals and your production needs overlap. We work with farm, farmers, ranchers, forest operations who are seeking help with conservation projects and conservation planning. So planning what goes on your land and how, how resources are conserved during that process of implementation. Uh, NRCS programs, cost share programs provide payments. They're not loans. And so we provide cost share to implement very specific conservation practices on your land. And typically cost share can range anywhere from 50 to 75% of the cost of implementation. Sometimes for historically underserved producers that cost share rate might increase based on the practices. Next slide, please. So a little glimpse into what we're talking about when we're talking about resource concerns. So. Some of examples of things that our programs address, um, we use the acronym SWAPA, so soil, water, air, plants, animals, and energy. And specific examples for each of those, just to sort of give you an idea of the things we work on, um, soil compaction and erosion, soil organic matter content, um, water, um, sedimentation into surface waters, nutrification of surface waters, depletion of groundwater resources. For air, we have pollution, dust, and odor control, um, as well as other resource concerns. Uh, plants, plant health and productivity, pest pressure. Um, for animals, livestock water distribution, or wildlife habitat, pollinator habitat are examples of animal resource concerns. And for energy, um, inefficient energy usage, um, inefficient irrigation water usage are some examples of addressing energy resource concerns. And again, there's, there's more resource concerns under each of these categories, but that's a, a glimpse as to the things we're aiming to address. Uh, next slide, please. So some specific examples of practices that would meet those um, resource concerns. So these are the type of specific practices we might include in a cost share contract. Um, and again, just a sampling 
There could be hundreds of practices available and depending on your location, your watershed, the type of your operation, what resource concerns are on site, certain practices may or may not be available to you. But some examples would be cover cropping, reduced tillage practices, pollinator plantings, high tunnels, grazing management, riparian buffers, irrigation efficiency, roof runoff structures, brush management, uh, invasive species control, another word for that, uh, manure storage facilities. So, you know, as you can see, a lot of these are things that will help address those resource concerns we talked about, but also things that can help with the production on your farm and help to meet your production goals on site. And so I just wanted to highlight, sometimes this is uh, sort of a gray area when you're first working with NRCS, um, as we are part of USDA, um, you know, our programs are definitely geared towards conservation, not necessarily production. And so um, I just put a few examples that can help you sort of start to understand, you know, the direction we're aiming for. So uh, we do have cost share programs that might help replace components of an existing irrigation system to help increase water efficiency and reduce groundwater depletion, but we don't necessarily install new irrigation systems for new operations because that's not really conservation oriented. Um, manure storage facilities to help protect water quality and to facilitate spreading manure in appropriate areas at appropriate times, but not necessarily building a barn. Um, pollinator and wildlife plantings to help increase pest control, um, wildlife habitat, but not necessarily planting a new orchard or a new vineyard or um, sharing on uh, seed cost for a new crop. Uh, we do work with fencing to exclude animals from livestock or to exclude livestock from surface waters to help protect water quality. And we do often cost share on fencing to divide pastures for the purposes of prescribed grazing, um, more intensive grazing rotations to protect soil quality, but not necessarily installing a perimeter fence or fencing in your field um, and reduce tillage practices. So we can work with you to help uh, your work more management practices into your system that reduce the intensity of tillage in your system to protect soil health, but not necessarily paying for new equipment. So those are just a few examples of conservation. Um, so who do we work with? Farmers, ranchers, and gardeners. So there's no minimum scale, and that's often something new producers are wondering about, you know, if I just have a, a one acre site or a, quarter acre production garden going market garden. Um, there's no minimum scale to work with us. Uh, we work on cropland, pasture land, non-industrial private forest, so uh, private forest land and grasslands. We work with individuals and businesses. So you can sign up as uh, a one person or if you have an established farm name, you can apply under your entity. Um, we do have an adjusted gross income eligibility limitation of $900,000 um, per year averaged over the last three years. Um, another big question that always comes up is, do I need to own the land? And nope, you don't. Um, we work with leased land or owned land um, as long as you're able to document um, with the owner that you have control of land and um, through a lease form that you're able to implement NRCS practices during the length of the contract, we can go ahead and contract directly with you. Um, water rights and irrigation history. This only qualifies if you're looking for irrigation practices on your land, um, but if you are looking for a program to implement irrigation efficiencies on your land, you would have to document water rights and document irrigation history for two out of the past five years. Um, and you need to have an established management system in place. So this is where the technical assistance versus financial assistance might come in. Um, if you've just gotten new land, you're looking to start an operation and you want some help uh, evaluating the resources on your land and the potential of your land, um, looking at the best soils for crops versus pasture, um, we can certainly provide technical assistance, but without an established farm in place, 
it might be premature to jump into the financial assistance if there's no resource concerns to be addressed at that time. All right, and I think this is where I take over, Stacey. Thank you Thanks, for, Steph. yeah. Um, and real quick, I just wanted to check in before I start on time. I wanna make sure I'm not hogging other agencies' time slots. You're doing good. Okay. Um, please, please flash the red light if I go on for too long. <laughs> um, all right, everyone. So yeah, so I'm Stephanie Payne, small farm and organic specialist, uh, serving everything east of the Cascades based out of Redmond. And I'll jump in and talk a little bit more about the process of applying for NRCS programs. Um, so preparing to work with the NRCS, like Stacey was mentioning, it's um, suggested it's to have a business plan in place before you decide to invest in infrastructure or approach NRCS cost share programs. Um, NRCS practices, each of them has a very specific lifespan for which they need to be maintained. As an example, if you were if applied for and awarded a high tunnel, you're expected to maintain that high tunnel system for five years. In the case of fencing, um, the lifespan for that is 20 years. And so each of the conservation practices have a very specific lifespan for which they are expected to be maintained. It's important to research your soils, the historic land use, site resources, and limitations before purchasing or leasing new land. And we can definitely help you out with this if that is something that you are in the process of doing or is on the horizon. Um, please reach out to us, we'd be more than happy to help. Um, be aware of highly erodible land, HEL, and wetland compliance, and how this can affect eligibility for USDA programs. I won't get into the weeds on the program now, but this would be, a, uh, if you wanted to know more, we're available for the breakout sessions later, and we can go in a little bit more detail on what that means. Um, same is true for any of these things we're talking about. Um, sometimes a conservation activity plan or CAP or maybe some extensive engineering assistance is required. Um, some of these activities, they can't be, cannot be pursued with financial assistance from the NRCS until these steps are first completed. So the applicant paperwork process, there's, there's a couple first steps that need to be taken. Um, number one is connecting with your local farm service agency to establish eligibility paperwork to assign a farm and track number to your operation. Um, there's a lot of paperwork involved in this, um, less so for an individual, more so for an entity. Um, things like, I think Stacy had mentioned that adjusted gross income form, if you're making $900,000 or less, averaged over three years, last three years, 1026, that's your HEL form, 902, it's a land ownership. These are all documents you need to fill out to establish yourself as a producer with FSA. So even if you are not intending to apply for FSA programs, FSA, Farm Services Agency, they manage all USDA farm records. So we need this to develop an NRCS application package first. Um, another part of the application paperwork process is to fill out an NRCS application or a 1200 you aren't considered signed up for any of our cost share programs until you've submitted this form. And as part of the NRCS planning process, we share your plan information with other agencies in order to conduct threatened and endangered species and cultural resource reviews for your site. It's a federal requirement for any federal dollars spent on private land. Um, something to keep in mind when establishing FSA records and filling out forms for NRCS, um, just to make sure that they're all established or associated with either one individual or entity, um, kind of just being consistent across those forms. Application development. So once you are established with FSA and you've applied for our programs, um, you're gonna maybe allow some time for site visits, uh, planning, reviews, and engineering possibly. It might take several weeks from the time you contact NRCS to the point where we can actually come out and do an on-site visit, depending on funding cycles and where we are in the year, whether government shutdowns or you know 
just workload in general. Um, complex application packages might take a year or more to develop, while simple plans might only take two months. So it really does vary depending on the complexity of the conservation plan. Um, it's best to be prepared and do some research, get estimates and make decisions in order to keep your application moving forward. If you're, say, looking to upgrade an irrigation system from um, flood to sprinkler, going to you know, your local vendors and getting estimates and having an idea of what that might cost out of pocket, those are good first steps to take. Submitting your application form is only part of the package that is submitted for funding consideration. If additional steps are not completed on time, your application may need to be deferred until the following year. So we do accept applications all year long, but if um, there's parts in the process that are taking longer, it might just need to be pushed into the next funding cycle. Financial considerations. So, all cost share payments will go to the direct deposit account on file. Uh, if you are responsible uh, for all costs associated with the completion of work, and that includes payment of contractors and materials needed, which obviously varies depending on market prices, um, something important, our cost share will remain the same regardless of those expenses typically. Um, NRCS contracts are not intended to cover 100% of implementation costs. Expect to invest your own capital when participating in NRCS cost share programs. Uh, cost share payments are issued when a practice is completed and certified that it meets NRCS standards and specifications, meaning you pay up front, we come out and certify that it's completed according to those specifications and standards, and then you are paid that cost share amount on what was actually applied. Um, there are 50% advanced payments that are available for some historically underserved applicants. Uh, anything that receives, any practices that receive an advance payment must be completed within 90 days of receiving that payment. Also something really important to consider, um, you know, kind of going back in, on how you apply, whether you're an individual or an entity, a lot of folks consider that um, when you take into consideration that NRCS cost share payments are reported as taxable income. Contract management. And so you are considered the general contractor, full responsibility to implement the contract, including responsibility for hiring contractors and sourcing materials. That is on you, that of the contract holder. You can complete the work yourself or you're more than welcome to hire someone to complete it. NRCS just doesn't, we don't install or line up any of that contracted work for you. So, so we don't that warning, Stephanie. Awesome, thank you. I think we're almost done here. I'll, I'll make it quick. So you don't start work until you're awarded the contract and funds are obligated and also making sure that there's a cultural resources component that needs to be cleared. Um, Contracts are awarded funding based on environmental benefit as funds allow. It's a competitive process. Completion of the contract in full is critical in keeping the contract in compliance and maintaining funding for contracted practices. So really, so I guess the main takeaway, I thought the most important thing right now, if, if, if you wanna apply for NRCS cost share programs, our next Application deadline is this November 19th for the fiscal, our 2022 funding season. Um, so we talked about getting established with FSA, submitting a 1200 form. This would all need to be happening before, well, at least the 1200 form by November 19th and starting that process with getting established with FSA. Um, work with an NRCS planner to schedule a site visit and develop a conservation plan for your operation and figuring out any other details that might be necessary. So reach out to your local NRCS office. And I think if we slip on over to the next slide, uh, these are some resources that you can reach out, um, both Stacy and I directly. Uh, we do recommend maybe contacting your local NRCS office first, and then they can direct um, you to us if, they, if it's relevant. Um, so just a couple links here to have on hand. And with that, I will wrap it up. Thank you so much. There's one job. question in the chat, Kathy, if the slide decks will be available. Yes, yes, we can make those available. And I will, uh, I'll put my contact information in the chat and anybody that wants stuff can reach out to me. Um, 
And are these kinds of programs available nationwide? Yes, they are. And at, I also wanted to mention that for Natural Resources Conservation Service and for most of Farm Service Agency, and maybe Derek, you can add to this when you're up, um, we have uh, uh, representatives covering virtually every county in the state. So if you um, just, you know, Google Natural Resources Conservation Service in your county, your county office, um, and make sure you put in Oregon, because we do have counties that are um, named similarly in other states, but um, your local county should pop up. So we are moving on to, um, oh, before I do that, I forgot the handouts. There are some handouts who, that are available. Um, the links are on our chat. Um, so you can scroll through there and see what we have available there. So for risk management, I'm pleased to introduce Nita Wallace. Nita is risk management specialist with the USDA Risk Management Agency out of Spokane. She's filling in for Anastasia Griffin, um, who is the, the risk management representative on our beginning farmer rancher team. Nita has been with the agency since 2009 and is responsible for overseeing cranberry, pear, stone fruit, plum, green peas. I don't know what PFR stands for, but maybe she'll tell us. Apiculture, nursery, and dry beans program. And Nita, thank you so much for being here and um, um, pinch hitting for um, Anastasia. We certainly appreciate it. You bet. And um, uh, PFR is uh, pasture, rangeland, and forage. Sorry. Of course. <laughs> I should have known that. Yeah, no worries. Makes so much sense now. <laughs> Well, good morning. My name is Nita Wallace, and I will be covering the USDA Risk Management Agency's programs. But before I begin, um, I just want to go over the disclaimer with you. So the purpose of the following material is to promote awareness of risk management uh, concepts and to highlight USDA's risk management products, features, benefits, and availability. Um, uh, the, this material does not change the content or the meaning of current policy provisions, filed actuarial documents, or approved procedures. So basically what the, the policy, the procedures, and the actuarial documents trump whatever I say. So I just wanted to go, that, go through that uh, next slide. Okay. Um, the USDA uh, Risk Management Agency was created in 1996. It serves America's agricultural producers through effective market-based risk management tools to strengthen the economic stability of agricultural producers and rural communities. Uh, RMA is committed to increasing the availability and effectiveness of federal crop insurance as a risk management tool. RMA manages uh, the Federal Crop Insurance Corporation or the FCIC to provide innovative crop insurance products to America's farmers and ranchers. Um, approved insurance providers or AIPs sell and service federal crop insurance policies in every state and in Puerto Rico through public and private uh, partnership with RMA. RMA backs the AIPs who share the risks associated with catastrophic losses due to major weather events. RMA's vision is to secure the future of agriculture by providing world-class risk management, uh, excuse me, tools to rural America. Next slide. Again, I'm from USDA Risk Management Agency out of Spokane, uh, out of the Spokane Regional Office and we administer the federal crop insurance programs in Alaska, Idaho, Oregon, uh, and Washington. And we also provide outreach um, to help farmers with risk management tools. Next slide, please. Okay, RMA um, is responsible for developing and maintaining the federal crop insurance policies. Um, this includes determining the rates, 
the prices and the yields for each crop uh, at the county level every year. RMA is also in charge of compliance to prevent fraud or abuse. Uh, private insurance companies and agents are responsible for selling insurance policies to farmers and then settling their claims. And the federal government subsidizes the premiums to reduce the cost of crop insurance for farmers and reinsures the private insurance companies to share uh, in the cost of those claims. Next slide, please. So what is crop insurance? Um, the federal crop insurance provides uh, protection from production loss, price decline, or a, uh, or a combination of, of both for individual commodities. There are um, production and revenue plans of insurance, which are based on a farmer's actual uh, production history, area plans of insurance that are based on average, averages in an area um, like by county. The Farm Service Agency also has a non-insured crop disaster assistance program known as NAP that's available in counties where RMA crop insurance is not available for that crop. Next slide, please. Okay, so the Farm uh, Service Agency's NAP coverage provides financial assistance to producers of non-insurable crops to protect against natural disasters that result in lower yields or crop losses or prevents crop planting. Next slide, please. Why should you consider federal crop insurance for your farm or ranch? Well, it may help you stay in business um, after a bad weather event or a low production year. Uh, the government subsidizes the premium to make it more affordable. It provides some financial stability and may uh, improve access to credit. Next slide, please. Organically grown crops covered under the crop insurance program, um, are, they're covered under the crop insurance program as long as uh, recognized organic farming practices are used. Next slide, please. Um, Production-based policies ensure against yield losses due to natural causes such as adverse weather, wildlife, insects, uh, and disease. If the harvested plus any appraised production is less than the yield insured, the producer is paid um, an indemnity based on the difference. Revenue policies provide protection against price decline or increase or a combination of both, in addition to yield losses. Projected and harvest prices are used to establish your coverage and determine whether you have a loss. And there is an additional premium cost for this additional coverage. Next slide, please. Okay, this is our crop insurance cycle. Well, there are four phases of the crop insurance cycle every year. Uh, the insurance plan, the level of coverage, and the price are selected when you submit an application. It's important to know the sales closing date and the cancellation dates, as these are deadlines for buying or canceling your policy. For example, uh, spring wheat sales closing date is September 30th and every crop has their own sales closing date. Um, there's also a date for reporting uh, how many acres you plant in order to determine your premium. If you have a loss, uh, you must provide a notice of loss to start the, the claim process. And RMA uh, may make program changes prior to the next year's contract change date. So uh, next slide, please. Farmers select their coverage, uh, their coverage level for crop insurance ranging from 50 to 85% of the yield and 50 to 100% of the price selection. The lowest level of coverage is catastrophic uh, insurance, also known as CAT. Uh, it covers 50% of the yield and 55% of the price um, election. There is an administrative fee of $655 in each county per crop for CAT insurance. Um, CAT is uh, similar to the Farm Service Agency's NAP program. Next slide, please. Okay, we'll move on to the Whole Farm Revenue Protection Program. Next slide. So uh, what does Whole Farm mean? Um, 
Whole farm revenue protection is available nationwide and ensures all commodities produced on your farm, uh, with a few exceptions uh, for forestry and pet or sport animals. Coverage is based on your allowable revenue determined by our previous, uh, your previous federal income tax returns. Specialty and organic crops and livestock are covered. However, there is a $2 million limit for animals and nursery. Next slide, please. Um, whole farm protects against loss of revenue from commodities produced on your farm. This includes a decline in production, price, or quality from unavoidable natural causes. There are also provisions for replant or if you are unable to plant. Next slide, please. Whole farm can be purchased alone or with other federal crop insurance uh, policies or NAP from FSA. When whole farm is purchased with another crop insurance policy, the whole farm premium is reduced due to the coverage provided uh, by the other policy. Next slide, please. To qualify for whole farm, um, you have to be a US citizen or resident, be eligible to receive federal be benefits, file a Schedule uh, F tax form, have five consecutive years of federal tax returns, and be in the business of farming. Oh, I forgot. Did I skip one? I'm going back here. Okay. Okay. Can you, uh, next slide, please. Okay. Now we should be on uh, what if I'm beginning, what if I'm a beginning farmer slide. That's it. Okay. Okay. If you are a beginning farmer or rancher, um, you only need three years of tax records instead of the five. To ensure for the 2022 crop year, you had to farm uh, in 2021 and have filed a Schedule F forms for 20, uh, 2018, 2019, and 2020. There's also an extra 10% premium subsidy for beginning farmers and ranchers. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, as part of the whole farm application, you will need to provide your insurance agent five years of Schedule F tax records for your farm a farm plan for the upcoming year with what you plan to produce uh, and the expected values and information regarding uh, commodity inventory or accounts receivable and payable. If you don't file a Schedule F, then you must provide your farm tax forms plus supporting information to complete a substitute Schedule F. Next slide, please. Your revenue coverage is either the average of your five-year farm tax history or what you intend to produce during the tax year, tax year whatever, uh, whatever is lower. And this amount is multiplied by the coverage level to determine the insured revenue amount. Claims are settled uh, after your taxes are filed, plus adjustments for inventory sold from previous, the previous year or unsold from the current year. Next slide, please. This is our website. Um, there's a lot of information on risk, uh, the risk management uh, agency's website. And here you can find an agent uh, by clicking on tools, which is circled up in red on the blue bar, and then selecting the agent locator, which is circled uh, in red. Next slide, please. Also uh, on the website, you can find information for beginning farmers, um, which is on the right side there, red arrow. Next slide. Okay. Um, on the website, you can find information under this link, which includes, uh, that's on the, under the beginning of farmer rancher uh, link which includes fact sheets, um, frequently asked questions, press releases, and more. And some of the general BFR or beginning farmer rancher benefits are there's no administrative fees, 
Uh, for premium subsidy policies, you get an additional 10% off for buyout policies. For transferred acreage, you can use the previous producer's production history with their permission if you were involved in uh, the decision making or in physical activities on the farm. Um, and then for losses, uh, an increase in the substitute yield adjustment, which allows you to replace a low yield from 60 to 80% of the applicable transitional yield or what we call T yield. And then the last slide, um, that's it for me, <laughs> short and sweet. Um, this is our contact information here uh, at our Spokane Regional Office. Um, please give us a, feel free to give us a call or, um, or email us, uh, we appreciate it. Uh, that's it for me, thank you. Great, thanks so much, Nita. Um, you'll notice that Aaron has added the slide deck into the uh, chat box. So you can either get the slides there or I've added my um, email information and I can send them to you via email. And with that, Derek Johnson with Farm Service Agency is up. Derek grew up in Malheur County on a dairy farm, helping his family grow their operation. After leaving to complete his degree at Oregon State University, how about those beavers and their winning football season? Just saying. Um, for a finance degree, he's spending time in various roles in various different jobs. Three years ago, he was hired as farm loan officer trainee and has since spent his time in Lake Klamath, Malheur and Harney County, making servicing and supervising farm service agency loans. So with that, you are up, Derek. Perfect. Well, thanks for having me, Kathy. Um, again, she's got everything down. I'm from loan officer in Mallard County right now. Um, I will throw it out. My slideshow is a little bit more um, tight than everybody else's. Uh, when you come to the FSA, after you've got through NRCS, after you've talked to everybody and figured out what you want to do, um, a lot of the things we do here are really tailored to each and every individual. Um, so there's really no hard, fast way to say, this is exactly how you farm, and this is exactly how you get along. Um, so with that, just keep that in mind as we move through, and, and we'll jump into the first slide. So getting started, um, again, everybody's situation is different, but the end all be all is I do two things. Um, I do operating loans, and I do farm ownership loans, or real estate loans. Um, so with an operating loan, or a full direct operating loan, we can go up to 400,000 bucks. Um, but you need a year of experience. So especially with beginning farmers and ranchers, I've found that that's really the biggest ob obstacle. How do I get into this? How do I get the experience necessary to get an operating loan? And we'll jump into that here in just a second, but let's get through what these loans do and, and how to use them. So with an operating loan, we can do two different kinds. There's an annual operating loan and there's a term operating loan. So with an annual operating note, we can pay for you know, annual reincurring expenses feed expenses, fertilizer expenses, seed expenses, um, anything like that. So that's easy enough. It's payable in a year. Um, we add the, uh, add the interest expense onto it and that's how much it is. It's really, really simple. A term note's a little bit more complex. Um, you can buy cattle, you can buy equipment and we can finance some improvements um, to your own real estate. But it gets a little bit more hairy there because um, those can go out to 15 years. It depends on how we do it. I mean, it depends on what your situation is. And again, those can go all the way up to 400,000. Now, a farm ownership loan or a real estate loan, is kind of a different animal. Um, and this is where things get hairy because as a, as a beginning farmer, it's tough to find a lease. And we all know that it's almost next to impossible, especially nowadays. Um, and getting three years of experience without owning a farm or knowing anybody is difficult, but you gotta have three years of experience on a farm ownership loan. It's hard and fast. One good thing about the three years of experience and experience in general is we can actually substitute that out. So if you have uh, a college degree in an ag-related uh, area, we can use that to substitute out one of the years. If you have military experience or if you've been on a farm and basically operated it yourself, we can use that management experience to basically get you eligible for one of these loans. There's a number of other eligibility criteria outside of just having history like credit history, we can't have you have late payments or anything like that. But again, everybody's situation is different and there are exceptions to every rule. Um, so a conversation about you know, what is experience, what is credit 
history is really best to be had with me individually or, or um, your local FSA rep. And just like Kathy was saying too, we have offices in every county. Even if we don't have a farm loan presence in those offices, we'll have somebody covering that area. So if you call and talk to the farm program side, um, they'll be able to hit, uh, hook you up with somebody on the farm loan side and, and get you taken care of. So another good thing about the farm ownership loans, especially for a beginning farmer, is if you do have that three years of history, we can do a, a loan called a down payment loan. So I ask for 5% down from you. Um, I'll give you 45% of the financing. And then you go to an outside lender and you ask for the additional 50%. It's a good loan, especially for bringing farmers, because you're going to get this uh, a great interest rate for me. It's one and a half percent. You do have to put some money down, but it's, if it's available, we could go out and buy a six hundred sixty-seven thousand dollar property. Again, you got to have that experience, and you got to have a few other things in order. You got to have a plan that makes sense, something that you know you're not going to lose money on. But overall, it's a really, really good option for someone who's just starting, has a little bit of money, and wants to buy some ground. Um, so now. How do we get experience? Again, there's, there's the biggest hurdle. Let's jump to the next slide and I'll talk about that. So getting experience is, it's kind of a different animal because without knowing somebody and having a relationship with them, it can be difficult to get a lease, but we have options still. So if you're able to find a lease or if you're able to work with your family or a lot of people work with their employers to run cattle with them um, or even grow hay with them or do something like that, we can start you off with a micro loan. A micro loan doesn't take the kind of experience that a full on direct loan does. A micro loan is still a direct loan, but it has lesser eligibility requirements, especially on the history side. So an FO, uh, we can do a micro loan on the FO side or an operating side. And uh, on the operating side, we can do annual and term loans, just the same as we would on the direct side. It has a $50,000 maximum. And on the FO side, we still require a three year history. So you're probably thinking, what, what does this even matter? It's the operating loans that really, really help here. So with an operating loan on a micro loan, all you need is a mentor. Uh, we can also use you know, your college history or anything like that. But if you have somebody who's going to be working with you, doing the things that you're going to be doing, um, that can give you advice, maybe it's your father, maybe it's your friend, uh, somebody who's been in the industry working through it, they can sign a form that says, yeah, I'll, I'll give them advice if they need it. They can come to me and we can talk about you know, how to make this work. Um, and with that, that fills the eligibility requirements for that. You would technically have that one year of history and we'd be able to give you a, a $50,000 loan. Not saying I'm going to give you a $50,000 loan, but that's something that if your plan shows you need it, we can do it. Another good thing, um, especially for younger farmers, uh, this is one of my favorite things to do too, is a youth loan. So if you have um, a son or a daughter or maybe a niece, nephew, something like that, that works with FFA, works with 4-H, or has a tribal youth organization they work together in, we can get them a $5,000 loan to work in their uh, income producing programs. So a lot of 4-H kids, a lot of FFA people, they're gonna take steers to show. Now, in some situations, people don't have the resources to just buy a steer, buy all the feed for it, and then get it to the fair. So we're able to walk in, um, get the parents to co-sign on the loan so they understand what's going on. Um, and help that kid buy a steer or maybe even buy a small herd so they can start calving out and just start their own little operation. Um, and if you think about it, we can start giving kids loans around the age of 10. I'll double check. Again, come and talk to me. Everybody's uh, situation is going to be different, but this is absolutely one of my favorite things to do. So having the kids come in and start farming, uh, it also gives them that one-year history too. So a successful repayment of a youth loan gives you that one year history requirement. We can start with operating loans and start to, to really finance them and grow an operation. So, and then we'll go on to the next slide here. This is my last slide. It really just has a lot of resources. I, I'm glad that we got to send out the slides because on the farm program side, I won't lie, I don't know a ton. Um, next meeting, on the next quarterly meeting, I'm gonna bring somebody in from the program side to talk a little bit about what we have coming up. And I'm extremely happy that Nita was here because I. I really wanna push the NAP program. For me, you gotta have insurance. That's the end all be all. If you don't have insurance, it, you know, sometimes it doesn't make sense. If you don't have any protection, uh, you're gonna get caught. Um, so absolutely, if you guys are working with me, talk to me and get that insurance done. And here's a link for you guys to jump in there and take a little bit more information.
Again, it has all the stuff that I talked about today on the micro loans, on the direct operating loans, and also has a little bit about guaranteed loans. Um, I'll make this quick because I know I need to finish up everything here, but a guaranteed loan for uh, a beginning farmer that has a few resources available could be a really, really good option. It's not something that I can give you an application for. It's something that you'll have to talk to your local lenders about and specifically local ag lenders. Um, not everybody does an ag loan, so you can't just walk into you know, your local credit union and get an ag loan most of the time. They have to be doing it and it's kind of a specific bank. But I can actually, I can help you find those and, and help point you in the right direction if nothing else. So if that's something you guys wanna talk about and guaranteed loans also have lesser history requirements. So it's always something we can talk about. There's never a, a dead end of the road. There's always a way to begin. So um, thanks for having me and, and it's good to see you all. Great, thanks, Derek. All righty. Um, Kathy, did you catch those questions for Derek in the chat? Oh, you know, I have my chat kind of covered up here. Um, so no, I didn't. So uh, can you experience farm ownership? Is it work experience or schedule F? So farm experience, uh, specifically for us, we can verify farm experience through schedule F. Uh, we can also get documentation. So if your uh, previous employer or whoever you operated the farm for is willing to sit down and write out what you did and sign a piece of paper and say, yep, they did all this and they have quite a bit of experience. It's something we can consider as well. It's, oh, great. Uh, that answers actually your second question. Does growing up and working on a family owned and operated bar qualify as experience? And just to piggyback on that one, it, it can. The, the, again, everybody's uh, situation is unique. Let's say, <laughs> um, let's say that you grew up on a farm and, and all you did was go out and, and just irrigated. I couldn't really take that kind of experience and say, okay, let's go start a cattle operation. But if you had an operation where you're managing a 500 head cattle, uh, you know, cow calf operation, you did all the, the buying of the feed, you sold the cows, you took the checks, you put them into the bank and paid the bills with it. That'd be something I could be like, okay, we can take that as experience. They actually operated the farm. Thank you for that clarification. All right, Kathy, that's all the questions in the chat. Oh, and Great. then Andrew's oh, wait, question, sorry. And on Andrew's questions here, um, to get an operating loan through the FSA, you don't necessarily have to be uh, turned down by conventional lenders, but through FSA, we're the lender of first opportunity and last resort. Um, we're not allowed to compete with other banks. So if you can get a bank through another loan, um, you got to do it. It doesn't mean you can't come in and ask. You can always put an application in and we can work through whether or not I'm your best option. Um, but again, like I tell everybody else, the last thing I want to do is waste anybody's time. Um, and with the amount of help we have right now and uh, the distance with the teleworking, it can be a little bit difficult for me to move as fast as I used to be able to. So in order to save time, it's always best to go talk to a lender and say, is this something you consider? If they say no, come to me and let's start. Great, thank you, Derek. Thank you, Corey. All right, now we're ready for rural development and Eric Malmer. Erica is a business and cooperative program specialist with USDA Rural Development. She served as the Value Added Producer Grant, VAPG, program coordinator for Oregon since 2020. She is eager to help her applicants submit the best applications possible for the 2021 VAPG competition. Yesterday, I was on a, the Northwest Intertribal Ag Council meeting and actually heard quite a bit on how she helped some agricultural producers um, with their applications. So I, I heard firsthand that this is a thing that she does. Erica uh, began her career with USDA as an intern working in single family housing programs in Oregon, and then took a position in the business and cooperative programs area where she's helped rural business owners, farmers and ranchers with their loan and grant proposals. She finds this work particularly rewarding and aligns with her long term career goals in public service. All right, Erica, with that. Thank you, Kathy. 
Um, and hello, everybody. Again, my name is Erica Molmer, and I am a business and cooperative program specialist with the USDA Rural Development, located out of our Portland, Oregon office. I am the value added producer grant coordinator, as well as the beginning farmer rancher coordinator um, champion for the state of Oregon rural development. Um, and together, these two roles serve one another very well. I interact with both beginning and non-beginning farmers and ranchers in my role as the VAPG coordinator. And I get to provide resources and guidance to other USDA uh, agencies may offer to help them meet their business and financial goals. In my role as the beginning farmer rancher coordinator, I get to guide folks towards the VAPG program and determine if they need, if they are indeed a good fit for the program. Um, which for beginning farmers and ranchers can be a pivotal moment in their development and um, startup costs. So um, first, I would like to mention that the 2021 VAPG cycle is over, but that I am eager to help applicants with their 2022 cycle, which will um, likely come, uh, come up around the beginning of the year, um, January. So I just wanted to clarify that. And uh, so I'll transition into talking about the two uh, grant programs that are the most, um, I guess, targeted towards farmers and ranchers. Um, so on the screen, what you see is the value added producer grant fact sheet. And I'm just gonna go over that a little bit in depth. Um, and in the next cycle, uh, the next quarterly meeting that we're going to have, I'm going to have a lot more of an in-depth presentation because it'll be um, right before the applications become available for um, people to apply for. So we'll get a little bit more in-depth in the next cycle. So what is the VAPG and how can it help beginning farmers and ranchers? The VAPG program helps agricultural producers in both rural and non-rural areas enter into value added activities related to the processing and or marketing of bio-based value added products. Generating new products, creating and expanding marketing opportunities and increasing producer income are the goals of this program. Independent producers, agricultural producer groups, farmer or rancher cooperatives, and majority controlled producer-based business ventures are all eligible applicant types to apply for this program. Grant and matching funds are, uh, can be used for planning activities or for working capital expenses related to producing and marketing value-added products. An example of a planning activity would include conducting a feasibility study and developing business plans for processing and marketing of the proposed value added product. And some examples of wor uh, working capital expenses include processing costs and salary expenses related to processing, marketing and advertising expenses and salary expenses related to marketing, and then some inventory costs. Um, the VAPG does not allow for applicants to purchase large pieces of processing equipment, um, vehicles, or buildings. It is really uh, for you know, bottles, labels, boxes, um, to pay for some small non-processing equipment pieces, such as um, you could purchase a laptop if you need it. You can purchase um, a label maker or maybe some countertop equipment for you know, mixers or um, utensils. So those are ty the types of items that you can purchase, just not big processing equipments or um, refrigeration type systems that are bolted into the ground. Um, I do wanna make it clear that the VAPG is a reimbursement based grant, which means that the applicant must spend their matching funds in advance of the grant funding uh, such that every dollar of the grant funds dispersed, not less than an equal amount of matching funds will have been expended prior to submitting a reimbursement request. Um, I was made aware that that was not clear from one of my applicants earlier, so I just want to make that clear. 
Each year, as mentioned earlier, the announcement for this grant is published in the Federal Register Notice around late December, early January. And around that same time is when the new application toolkit will be published. So I highly recommend to anyone who's interested in this program to reach out to me via mail, email or uh, phone to discuss your ideas for the project before you decide to dive into the application because it is rather lengthy and um, I'll help you decide whether or not it's worth your time or you know, if it's something that you feel like you can take on during harvest season. Um, and yeah, we'll discuss important details of the application toolkit, regulations, which dictate what is and is not allowed with federal funds. So uh, this is, I don't know if you can tell or not, my favorite program. Um, I really love working with applicants and learning about their different value-added products that they develop. We have everything ranging from meat packaging to kombucha to honey, um, beer. There's just so many different products that Oregonians come up with. And it's, it's really fun to help them through the process because it is uh, stressful trying to fill out a government application for a grant when you're not a grant writer, you're a farmer. And I totally understand that. So I'm here for uh, any, anyone that wants to discuss their program or project before the application. Um, and so uh, Aaron, I think maybe, or Corey, could you maybe switch over to the second um, fact sheet? Cause next I'm gonna talk about our second grant available to ag producers. And that is the REAP grant, the Rural Energy for America grant. Erin, if you've got that one, I did not grab it. I thought there was just the one. I can get it real quick. Sorry about that, Erica. Nope, no problem. It should have at the very least been included in handouts. It's another 508 numbered handout. Yeah, I saw it linked earlier, maybe. Yeah, it was the very first handout actually that was linked in the chat. Oh, I've got it. Just a second and I will bring it up. Thank you. Uh, and Erica, did you see that you, your contact information was asked? Yes. This looks like uh, it's the same one. Hold on. I'm gonna put my email in the chat right now. Oh, Reap, got it. Here we go. And my phone number. There's my information to anyone asking in the chat. Okay. I am sharing it in T minus three seconds. <laughs> Optimizing the document on the screen, getting to my Zoom and it's ready to go. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Okay. So similar to the VAPG, I'm sharing what you're looking at on the screen is the fact sheet. Um, so the USDA Rural Development Grant Program, the Rural Energy for America Grant, um, we acronym it REAP, um, for Rural Energy and Energy Efficiency. So this program provides guaranteed loan financing and grant funding to agricultural producers and rural small businesses to purchase or install a rural energy system or make energy efficiency improvements. Um, so those who may apply for this grant include agricultural producers in both rural and non-rural areas with at least 50% of their gross income coming from agricultural operations. Um, also non small non-agricultural businesses in, in, in eligible rural areas are eligible to apply. So kind of cool that ag producers can be rural or non-rural, but small businesses have to be rural. Um, funds may be used to purchase, install, or construct a renewable energy system, such as a biomass system, uh, and, which includes an anaerobic digesters, um, which for those of you who don't know what that is, it is a cool contraption that turns manure into energy. 
Uh, so if you have an animal-based um, business, then that might be something you would consider to offset your energy costs. It could also be used to purchase geothermal um, for electric generation, hydropower, hydrogen, small, large wind, small and large solar, and then tidal, ocean stuff. I know that most of those don't really pertain because the farms are generally located in rural um, field type settings, but um, the large wind and the small and large wind and small and large solar are the most popular for our ag producers. They normally put solar on top of their farms. Um, and then of course, another great uh, benefit of this program or option is to fund the purchase, installation, or construction of an energy efficiency, eh, efficiency improvement, um, such as heating, ventilation, air conditioning, uh, insulation, lighting, cooling, and refrigeration units, and then doors and windows. And I like to point out that this grant um, can be the uh, substitute for the VAPG not allowing you to purchase those large refrigeration units that um, are so necessary in a lot of operations. You could apply for an energy efficient refrigeration unit or freezer through the REAP program rather than the VAPG program. So that's um, something I wanted to point out. So for REAP loans, grants, and loan grant combos, the applicants must provide at least 25% of the project cost if they're applying for a loan or uh, loan grant combination. So um, yeah, you, uh, it's a 25% cost match for that um, grant. Uh, and then lastly, I wanna say that uh, for more information about the REAP program, uh, and, such as grant application windows, regulation requirements, max loan and grant amounts, et cetera, uh, I am not the point of contact for that program, although I am presenting it. Um, our point of contact is Jessie Huff, and I will also provide her contact information in the chat. Um, she is our energy coordinator, and she is a boss. She just is so great at what she does, and she will um, you know, help you out with any questions that you have about eligibility, application, all that stuff. So... Thank you all. Uh, that concludes my presentations on the VAPG and the REAP grant. Um, and then, of course, please don't hesitate to ask any questions, email me any questions about these two amazing programs. Thanks. So you did have one question in the chat, and that is, are these grants competitive like the other ones? I think um, he was referring to the REAP grants. Yes, uh, the REAP grants are competitive. Uh, I believe they're competitive at a state level um, instead of a national level, uh, like the VAPG is. The VAPG is a national competition, um, but we do get a considerable amount of funding for the REAP grant. Um, it just depends on which cycle you're applying for because they have different cycles based on the amount that is being requested. So I think if it's like less than 20,000, then it, you compete with this group of people. If it's more than 20,000, you compete with this group of people. So that is um, definitely something I would encourage you to verify with Jesse on. But yes, all of our grants are highly competitive. Oregon is a very robust state, so we always have a lot of um, applicants for each program. And then do you need to have an established business to be eligible? Um, I, uh, an established ag business? Uh, mm, I get, if you're asking if it can be a startup, uh, there. It's similar to um, some of the other USDA programs where we don't really have a minimum. So I guess that would be a, a question that I would wanna answer directly with a little bit more information because I could provide some more guidance on how, you could, how and what you would apply for. And I also, I guess my follow-up question would be, would that pertain to the VAPG or the REAP grant because it might differ. All right. 
Now, um, now we're going to go ahead and we're going to move into the breakout sessions. So we're done with the main presentations. Um, these are going to be by agency for the most part. So there will be one for rural development, one for farm service agency, one for natural resources conservation service. And we're going to combine risk management agency with um, kind of aspiring farmers. Um, this group is for those people who have, haven't actually started farming yet. You're planning to, you're hoping to, you're wanting to, but you're not quite there yet. Um, and I've kind of instructed my folks to, you know, hang out in their respective areas for a little while, see who shows up. Um, this is your chance to do some one-on-one -on -one with them. Um, um, and, and if you don't have any questions of anybody, then you're done. Although, please fill out our poll. Nobody's filling out the polls. Please fill out our polls. So we they are. Oh, okay, great. Because I'm not seeing it on my side. Um, so we get a sense of one, how we did, and two, how we can serve you next time. You can also reach out to us via our contact information as well. I did post the dates for the next sessions. And we will be sending that information out um, soonish uh, for January. So, um, all right. And then for um, all the agency people, just a reminder check in with Aaron before you take off um, so we know that you're done. Thank you, everybody. And, and real quick, I will just add that um, if you want to hop in and out of the breakout sessions, there's the ability to okay. do that. Uh, so just go back into the main room and then we'll reassign you to the to the other breakout room if, if you have that as an option. So I will open up the breakout rooms and you'll have the opportunity to pick one uh, that you want to go into. Thanks everyone for the feedback, really appreciate it. Hope to see you in January. <laughs>